morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to Chabot College. Before we get started, there was a request that if you're sitting um, out uh, at the edge of an, of an aisle, if you have the ability to move in, that would be helpful so we can accommodate late arrivals in a way that's less disruptive. So just a, a quick request. We appreciate your attendance here this morning. My name is Dionisia Ramos. I'm the Director of Public Relations, Marketing, and Government Relations for the Chabot Las Positas Community College District, and I'll be moderating today's event. We're delighted to have with us Dr. Jamal Cooks. He's joining us today for Chabot's President Finalist Forum. Before we formally welcome Dr. Cooks, let me take a minute to review what to expect for today's public forum. The forum is scheduled for 60 minutes. We will have approximately 18 minutes for general questions posed by the moderator, and another 25 minutes for audience questions. The candidate will have four to five minutes to provide brief opening remarks, and I'll provide a time check after the five minutes. There are four general questions that have been prepared to help facilitate the session. I will ask each question and allow the candidate to respond. There are microphones set up on either end of the room. After we conclude the general question portion of the forum, audience members may line up behind the microphone to ask a question. I welcome you to start by sharing your name and your role with the district or in the community. Please limit your question to 30 seconds and just one question per person. Please be courteous in your manner of asking questions and five minutes before the end of the session, we will conclude audience questions and invite the candidate to provide a brief closing statement. Audience members will have the opportunity to complete feedback forms. Uh, those will be online following the forum. Links will be provided on the President's Search webpage, as well as uh, the QR codes that you see here at the entrance to this room. Information on accessing the recorded forum and the feedback forms will be provided via email after the forum. All surveys are anonymous. The feedback forms will be compiled and shared with the chancellor to be included in his del deliberation. We thank you all again here for your presence. And with that, we will begin today's forum. I'd like to now formally welcome Welcome, Dr. Jamal Cooks. Dr. Cooks, it is our pleasure to invite you to provide a brief opening statement. You have five minutes allotted. Thank you for that introduction, Dio. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Chancellor Gearhart and also the Board of Trustees, as well as the Chabot Las Positas uh, District for this opportunity to talk with you today. Um, just to share a little bit about myself, I'm originally from East Oakland. Uh, I grew up with my mother and my father. My father was uh, in the military. He was in the Air Force. He retired and then worked at Owens, Illinois Glass Company for approximately 20 years. Uh, he was a machine technician. From my father, I learned about work, being diligent, organized, being structured. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, uh, was very social. And so she sold Avon door to door. Um, yes, there were people that really did door to door to meet people. Uh, she also volunteered at our church. She volunteered at uh, the small church school that I attended, uh, working in the front office. And so from both of them, what I learned was about uh, working diligently to serve. And that's absolutely uh, formed my professional career. Uh, I've been a teacher. I was a seventh grade social studies teacher at King of States Junior High School. Um, I also taught, uh, actually I started teaching in 1993. I was 10 and uh, <laughs> what basically happened was that uh, I then began to teach at the community college level. I taught at, uh, while in graduate school, started at Washtenaw Community College and began to teach at Peralta English, at Peralta uh, upon returning back to the Bay Area. Um, my wife and I had an educational tutoring business called Academics for Success, where, uh, believe it or not, we started with $100 uh, 
a fictitious name statement and tutoring in Kentucky Fried Chicken and the coffee shop next door. In a few years, maybe five or six years, that program grew to uh, having about 60 employees uh, providing after school tutorial uh, workshops and about an annual budget of about $300,000. Um, at the same time, I was a professor of language literacy and culture at San Francisco State. And now, as you know, being here for the last five years as the Dean of Language Arts and also the Vice President of Academic Services, um, I believe that this has led me to this point to be the next president of Chabot College. You might ask, why here, why now, and why me? Well, why, why here is because I believe that the programs, the projects, and the uh, initiatives that we have at Chabot College are like none other. Um, I've visited, had the opportunity to visit a number of colleges, uh, community colleges, and they are always in awe of the amount of programs and the type of work that we do. I think why now? When we talk about equity, when we talk about moving out of uh, being, moving into the post-COVID uh, time, I think we have to figure out from our students and, and understand what do they need and how can we as a community college provide that. I believe that why me leads with my character, with my competence, and my confidence. In terms of character, I believe as a leader, I lead with uh, integrity, I lead with humility, and I lead with my heart. And when we do this kind of work in education, we have to understand it is hard work. It's very hard work, but it's also heart work. And if we're going to be a college for the community, we have to always keep that in mind. When we talk about competency, uh, being the Vice President of Academic Services, I've had the, the pleasure of working as the ALO uh, for our college and moving us through the accreditation process. Uh, that along with other experiences, I believe I have the competency to lead us into the next phase for Chabot College. And finally, with confidence, I believe that um, no one showed me how to be the first African-American male full professor in the College of Education at San Francisco State. Nor was there a handbook on how to be a community college administrator. But in all those ways, I found ways to figure it out. I figured it out by listening, by learning, being open to learning, and loving the people that I work with, the institution that I work with, and the students that I work for. And so for those reasons, I believe I'm the best candidate to be the next president of Chabot College. Thank you. We'll now begin with the first question. The president of Chabot College is expected to be the voice of the institution's mission, values, concerns, and aspirations. What do you think are key components of successful internal and external communication strategies? How would you prioritize different constituencies? Thank you for the question. So I think, first of all, you have to start with the mission, and the mission discusses and talks about uh, preparing our students for academic success and also for uh, the job workforce. And so I think when we look at that, it connects with our master plan that talks about uh, decreasing barriers, right, equity, along with preparing them academically and for the workplace. And so when I think of communication uh, to internal and externally, I think that we, we have to, this, for me, this connects with enrollment. To, and that may be another question, and if I'm getting ahead of myself, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that. But I think what ends up happening is that when we communicate with uh, young people, when we communicate with potential uh, students that are going to come to Chabot, we have to figure out what do they want. I think sometimes we get locked into um, tradition. We get locked into finding, doing the same thing over and over. And I think that there's a, there's a value to that, but I also think we can expand. What do I mean by that? I think that social media is very, very important as we move in this post-pandemic state. Um, I have a 15-year-old daughter, and I can tell you, they like to take pictures. They like to post. They like to get the likes. They want all of that energy around, hey, we want you here with us. I think that that's something that we can absolutely look into and lean into is to figure out how do we, how do we create an environment here on our campus? How do we create an environment that students want to be a part of? How do we articulate that outwardly to those potential students? 
Um, I also think that another part is that we, we have to do this one-on-one -on -one kind of, of, of uh, communication. I think that, uh, yes, mailers are important. I think that email is great. Uh, but I also think that the personal connection that we have with our friends and family is always very, very important. As an example, uh, I had a, a uh, community member ask me, she said, hey, I want my kid to take some dual enrollment classes this summer. I said, well, we have dual enrollment classes. She said, well, well how, do you, how do you sign up for them? I said, well, you know, and I explained it. She said, well, I have a few other friends that want to know more about that. I said, okay, well, great, cool. I said, you know what? Uh, next Wednesday, we'll have a session on Zoom. I posted it on my Facebook. Um, I, we had about 10 families. Uh, and Dean Patton came, she spoke as well, and walked them through this process of dual enrollment. So that's 10 students, 10 families that are signing up with Chabot. Not just the students, but even other conversations with the adults and the parents about potentially taking classes. The best part about that is she texted me two days later and said, hey, I just wanna let you know I got another 10. When can we run it back? So when I'm talking about communication, I think that there is a macro level communication, but I think we have to have an opportunity to lean in into the micro piece of communicating with the outside community and our constituents. I think on campus, again, we have to do individualized personal communication. What do I mean by that? Our learning communities are awesome. Our learning communities rock. And part of why they do so is because it's high touch because there's communication, there's, there's a friendship, there's a trust that's built between the uh, staff and faculty of that, those particular learning communities and our students. So the question becomes, how do we do that at a larger level? And as president, that would be something that I would wanna work with uh, staff and faculty, classified professionals, uh, to be able to think about how do we uh, take that same individualized high touch approach with the larger population. Thank you. Recognizing that we all have some limitations, what characteristics or qualities might hamper or enhance your effectiveness as president? It is said that we learn from our mistakes. Can you mention an honest mistake that taught you an important lesson and how you confronted the consequences of that mistake? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, very similarly, I, I think that you, you, we learn in our valleys and not at our peaks, right? Because that's, in our valleys is when we're, we're paying a little more attention, right? Instead of the peaks when everything is going well. And uh, the, the first example that comes to mind was a disagreement with a, um, another administrator when I first arrived. And uh, without going fully into detail, the, uh, the, the conflict uh, came to an head uh, and when we had a conversation. Um, when we started having the conversation, I'll just say that I wasn't, I didn't take the high road. That's a good way. I didn't take the high road in that moment. And in having the conversation with uh, this fellow administrator, uh, they didn't take the high road either, but, but I should have. <laughs> I should have taken a high road. And it wasn't until afterward that I realized I didn't like the feeling that I didn't take the high road. I didn't like the way that I allowed this particular situation, the person in this particular situation to quote unquote push my button. And I, I vowed at that moment, I would not allow that to happen ever again in a work environment. Um, because I believe that in leadership, uh, the leader is, is, is a mirror. So the way that you want uh, people that work with you, for you, um, next to you, the way that you want them to work you have to model that behavior. So if you're a, uh, if you're a leader that's always up and down, um, 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 and the people that work with you don't really know who you are every time you walk into the room or how you might respond, um, I think that that creates a problem because that, that creates a lack of trust. And I think that if people know who you are and you are authentic and you are consistent, then I believe that it makes it easier for other people to follow in that particular situation as the lead. Thank you. 
How do you envision working to make higher education more accessible and affordable for all students, regardless of their background or financial institution? Oh, I'm sorry, financial situation. <laughs> do you want me to read that back to you? Sure. <laughs> sorry about that. How do you envision working to make higher education more accessible and affordable for all students, regardless of their background or financial situation? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is thinking about the SCIF, right, for the funding formula, is that we have the 70% for students uh, that are actively enrolled. We have 20% of that funding formula is based on financial aid completion, and the 10% being re, uh, around degree completion and certificate completion. So. Um, for the 20% is where I think that we can, uh, we have opportunities to find creative ways to get students to complete these, these forms. Um, and if they complete the forms, working with their families, working with their parents, I mean, I think as, as president, one thing I would definitely want to do is we've had a great, uh, uh, Vice President Critcher has done a, and his team have done a great job of bringing families to campus post-COVID, a great job. Um, I think one of the ways that we might be able to build upon that is to uh, definitely have the computers out, definitely walk them through, and, and because I think once they get on our campus, it's, we, we kind of, we have them in some sense. <laughs> we have them to apply for financial aid. We have them to apply for, uh, for classes. Um, I think when we talk about barriers, I think CCC apply. Um, although it's been something that we've used uh, and we use it across the state, I think that that's, there's an opportunity to explore other options to CCC apply. Uh, as an example, I have a young man that I'm mentoring at uh, St. Joseph High School. And uh, I, I, whenever students come uh, to me, I walk them around the campus, I take them to, um, I take them to EOPS, I walk them around 700. I do that every, for every student um, that walks into my office that, I'm, you know, that I know and they're coming here for me, I, we do that every time. Well, I reached out to a young man uh, to follow up a week later and he hadn't gotten his W number yet, right? So if he's not connected to me, he might decide to go somewhere else. He might decide to do something else um, instead of um, enrolling here. So I think when we think about CCC Apply, we have to make, uh, make it take an opportunity to look at are there other um, uh, options in terms of the application process to make it easier for students to be able to enroll. Um, I think when we think about financial, uh, along with the financial aid, I think there's also this idea of scholarships. Um, I have an idea that as president, I would want to explore maybe a president's circle of donors, of corporate sponsors, so to speak. Um, from my understanding, there's been conversations around that, but that's something I would like to continue to work with uh, Yvonne and her team and the foundation uh, around. That not only in terms of donating funds, but also, um, also in, in talking about corporate sponsorships, apprenticeships opportunity, job placement, and, and the like. So I think those are some opportunities that we might have in terms of um, creating scholarships, more scholarships for students. Also, I'm part of the uh, working with Christina Moon and John Chan that uh, with our OER ZTC, right, our Open Educational Resources and Zero Textbook Cost Program. Uh, this program started around four years ago, and we just kind of pieced together uh, reassigned time for each of them throughout this process. We started uh, with about single digits in terms of classes that were OER, ZTC. We then moved to um, uh, around the 20-something percent uh, tag at uh, last year. At the end of last year, we were around 32, 33 percent, and I'm proud to announce that this year, um, I believe, cross, fingers crossed, that we're at 50% of OER ZTC. And I think that when we talk about how do we decrease barriers um, and take away barriers for students uh, financially, I think that's a, one very good way. Um, that yes, there's the tuition piece, but then once they get into the classes, they still have to pay for books and resources. And so I think that this initiative of OER and ZTC, um, I can safely say, I believe we're in the top three or top four of colleges our size that is at such a high percentage. And so I'm very, very proud of that work um, by John and Christina and their team. 
Thank you. Last question before we move to audience questions. How do you plan to stay informed about the evolving needs and expectations of students, faculty, classified professionals, administrators, and the broader higher education landscape? And the broader landscape, okay. Um, so I would say on campus, on campus, um, when we're talking about with students, for example, uh, a lot of people already know that uh, I have a, kind of a, a pipeline to Chabot with a number of students that I either mentor or work with. And so that's where I usually start, is I ask, just ask them questions. I ask them questions about their experience, not only uh, while they're at Chabot, but prior to coming to Chabot, and also what do they want to do when they leave Chabot. So um, I believe I have a, a, a sense, um, I get a, a quick sense about student needs on a regular basis. Um, I think, again, there's learning communities. We, yes, we have Emoja and we have Puente, which this is the home of, uh, but we also have uh, other other uh, learning communities that are great with uh, Change It Now, uh, also with um, also with uh, Nisian Unite, and also with Movement. Um, and in doing some research, finding that the AAPI community is the fastest growing population in the state, um, I think this shows that uh, that Chabot is ahead of the curve by having those communities, those learning communities of Nisians Unite, and also um, and Movement. Um, I think when we talk about uh, working with faculty, working with classified professionals, first of all, I have an open door policy. I've had an open door policy as a, um, as a teacher. I've had an open door policy as a dean, open door policy as a, um, as a vice president. Um, open door doesn't mean you get to see me that moment, but it does mean that I w want to hear from you. I want to have a conversation. I want to know what the needs are. Um, we don't, we don't, you know, sometimes as administrators, uh, we're, we're trying to move the college in a particular way, and so there are some things that, uh, that happen, may have happened in a meeting, may have happened um, on a, on a, you know, publicly um, at a shared governance committee meeting, uh, and, and it bubbles up. And so sometimes we don't even know what's going on until it bubbles up and it's an, like it's an issue. Yes, is that what you're, it becomes an, it, it wasn't an issue, but now it's a big issue, and now it's on my desk. And so part of what um, I think that's important is to be able to talk with faculty, talk with classified professionals, talk with students along the way. Uh, I, I'm going to say this about classified professionals. Um, as I noted, uh, my, my father was in the Air Force and a machine technician. Uh, my mother volunteered at our church and, um, and in the front office of the school. Uh, I... I support classified professionals. I, I learned as a seventh grade teacher that uh, the, I thought the principal was the most important person. I actually thought that um, the head teachers were the most important people. I learned in the first 30 days that the admin at the front desk, Mrs. Smith, and the custodian, they were the most important people. If I didn't get, if I did, nothing moved without them. So I learned that at a very, very early age professionally, and so I think, I feel the same way here. I know that classified professionals work really, really hard, and I know that classified professionals, I'm gathering um, that, that uh, from something last night at the board meeting that there, there's, um, uh, that there was an incident where a classified professional didn't feel as heard or felt that uh, an administrator was um, not respecting them as a colleague, and there's no room for that. There, there's no, no space for that, there's no room for that. So as president, I, would, I think it's important for us to uh, go and uh, re-examine, re-examine our tri-chair model. Not that we're gonna make changes, but that we're going to be able to go back and say, hey look, what were we originally trying to do? And see, are we doing it? And see if, if it's working for everyone in the particular format that it's in. I believe that those voices still have to be heard. And I think that, uh, however, I think that everyone that's involved has to respect every opinion and every perspective. Um, finally, I got, do I have finally? <laughs> finally, I think with faculty, being a faculty member for over 20 years, I, I believe and I know that our product as a college is our curriculum, our instruction, and our assessment. That, that's our product. And we have to make sure that we continue to do a great job in the classroom for our students. 
That's how they're going to be able to finish and complete their certificates and degrees. That's how they're going to be able to get the, the job, fin be the, do the job placement and the classes that they need to be able to go and make uh, livable wages for themselves and for their families. Um, I think that we have pieces like CCEPG. Uh, they do a wonderful job. Uh, Kristen and Carmen and their team do an outstanding job with talking about culturally relevant pedagogy. And when we talk about culturally relevant pedagogy, we have to make sure we're very clear. When, when, I, when I began to do work with this in the, uh, in the 90s, there was Gloria Latsing Billings, if people are, are familiar in the, in the 90s, talking about culturally relevant pedagogy. It then began to change and shift. You had James G. that talked about what is literacy and began to talk about that, that this idea of, lingu of linguistic difference is not based just on race, but that is based on social political issues, right? You then began to see that people were talking about, then it became uh, D, diversity, then it became DE, and then it was DEI, DEIA, then it was JEDI, and then it went back to DEIAA, right? So at the end of the day, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about equity, when we're talking about getting everyone what they need to be able to be successful, that's not only for our students, but that's also for our classified professionals and our faculty members. So as president, I think that professional development um, in ways in which that are going to uh, um, move people forward is important. Uh, do I mean that it's just gonna be an open blank piece of paper where everyone can go, you get a PD, you get a PD. I don't know if it's that way, but I do think it's an opportunity to think about and focus how do we, how do we get the most quote unquote bang for our buck by sending people to different professional developments uh, opportunities and how do we, and what are we getting when we come back in terms of instruction, in terms of working with students alike. Thank you. We will now transition to questions from the audience. There are microphones on either end. We'll start with whoever gets to the microphone first. <laughs> um, and then we'll alternate on either side of the room. A reminder that you will have 30 seconds to ask your question and just one question per person, please. We have a total of 25 minutes for this section. And I'll... I'm gonna let Bob go first. Thank you, okay, we'll start over here. Ah, good morning, Dr. Cooks. Good morning. Congratulations on being one of the four uh, finalists. Thank you. Um, I would like if you would share um, what you've learned in your position as vice president about working with and supporting career education programs and how you will see your role as president to continue that work, especially those that have unique partnership um, agreements. Thank you, Bob. That's a great question. Um, First of all, uh, I had some limited experience with that prior to being in this seat as the Vice President of Instruction. Um, I will say that one of the first things I did is uh, as I reached out to Christina Reed and began to talk to her about uh, CE. And we were meeting fairly regularly because I wanted to get an idea about what, 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 what's, going on, what's going on, what's in the field, how do we fill that gap? Right. Uh, we've had conversations about um, with with all those different fields talking about what's what's around the corner. Right. What's the job that's five years, 10 years down the line? And how do we start creating? Right. If we backwards plan, how do we start creating programs that are going to have be pre prepare people for those jobs five and 10 years down the line? So I think that's that, that was kind of my first uh, um, uh, component of that. I think the second component was. Uh, going to the fire, <laughs> the new fire center, uh, and being blown away by this uh, collaborative effort between the city and um, and the fire department and Chabot, and this was this was great. Um, I think it's uh, definitely opened my eyes to other opportunities. Um, I was I was able to go to a regional meeting with uh, Dean Coleman, and there were um, maybe about seven six or seven other districts around. And the short version is that uh, one of them, I believe in the San Jose area, was beginning to have a fire camp for girls. Now, I won't go into too much detail, but I watched Chicago Fire, right? 
And there's this, there's this, this part of the program where, uh, where girls on fire were being uh, apprenticed to, to be firefighters. And I immediately turned to Dr. Dean Coleman and was like, we need to be part of that. I don't, I, and I actually, to be honest with you, I actually said, how do we get it just with us, right? Like, <laughs> I was like, how do, how do we get it? Because if, that, if we can get something like that, um, I think that that absolutely um, um, cracks the mold. And I think, and we also have begun to have conversations about how do we do that for, um, for the Sheriff's Academy? How do we do that, right, that we bring more women into, um, into public safety? So um, I'm not sure if I fully answered the question, but yes, the more that I've been, been involved, the more, more that I'm exposed to it, I definitely am getting creative ideas um, about how we can move forward. And that's something uh, that not only I'm doing now as the VP, but I would also continue to do as the president of Chabot. Thank you. Okay, I'm a rule follower, so I'm gonna follow Dio's. I am Christine Herrera, <laughs> and I am the senior admin in the president's office. Um, as a confidential, supervisors and confidentials are not and do not have union representation. As our leader, president, how will you support and guide the confidentials and supervisors that come to you with issues or concerns, and especially for those in the president's office? Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I think that all of the, all of the folks that fall into that category, um, I think it's important that there's trust and there's open lines of communication. I think that's first and foremost. What I what I found being in in the leadership position is sometimes there's a there's a fear of what possibly could happen, as opposed to, and I think that's from a lack of trust. I think when you trust. You believe that if I go to, in this case, the president, to give some kind of information, um, that they're going to believe you, that they're going to want to support you, and that they're going to try to figure out a, a solution to whichever, whatever that problem is. Um, as the president, I think that uh, I, I encourage, I would encourage anyone from the president's office to, um, to, to help maintain the balance. Right, meaning that if, if uh, as president, if I make, if I look like I'm going down a, uh, uh, the wrong road, please grab the steering wheel, bring me back. Right, like, like let, let's not let's not go there if that's something that uh, that we don't think is going to benefit the college. Um, I don't. I think again when I talked about leading with integrity, and leading with humility, and leading with my heart, um, I don't get bent out of shape, so to speak, about people uh, giving comments to me. I don't take it as a negative feedback. I don't take it as critique. I take it as the, these people are, or a person, they're trying to help us figure out a solution. And I ultimately want to get to a solution to be able to move the college forward. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Robert Yes, math faculty member. And I have a long question, but shorter than when I asked it earlier. Um, <laughs> Okay, there are California community colleges that have included in their implementation of AB 705 slash 1705 the removal of pre-transfer math courses from their course offerings. Some also do not offer non-credit courses. How would you advise a student who, after starting transfer level math, a math course, has not been successful even with tutoring, with in-class support, or co-requisites, the student feels that repeating the transfer level course would be frustrating and they, that, that they need to build their more solid foundation, perhaps due to COVID learning or inadequate learning in high school. But the institution does not offer the, the foundational pre-transfer class they need. Without credit course available, they would, have to, um, they would have trouble meeting their financial aid eligibility. That's for the non-credit part. Um, and they would also overburden their load uh, by taking an additional non-transfer class. What would be that student's path forward? Thank you for the question. Uh, well, first of all, let's start with AB 1705, right? Uh, the idea of uh, removing pre-transfer level classes in English and math from the schedule, um, at AB 705, it was highly recommended. In AB 1705, it, it's a law, right? So, that, so I think we, have to, we start there. I think when we talk about working with students, I would hope that uh, the different departments, particularly math and English, would be able to have a variety of different things in place um, to help that student before even getting to that part, 
right? And I will answer the question, but before they even get to that part, we have tutoring um, um, in the, in the um, um, learning connection. We have opportunities that if students are having trouble with classes to be able to visit their counselor. There may be an opportunity to either drop the class or move the class, maybe go to an, um, a different section. There may, maybe that's part of the concern. I think that sometimes when we look at the, um, at the final product, the idea that the student has already not passed the class, is already frustrated, there in some sense <laughs> becomes, uh, becomes, I'm sorry, was that a sign? <laughs> there becomes, there, there becomes th this, this idea that, um, well, we don't have any other options. I think there's always options. I think there's always options, and when we talk about, um, as president, I would like to continue to have conversations with math and English to talk about how we're going to be able to move forward with the, this mandate of AB 1705. Okay. R. Barboza, EOPS. I have a quick question, Dr. Cooks. Look, on this, look at this audience, then look at our campus. You as a black man, how do you convince, you know there's someone on our campus is a racist. So how do you convince them that you are the right black man? Not just the man, but the black man for this job. I'm the blackity black man, the black, black, <laughs> black, black man. All right, um, so, so here, here's the piece. I, I think that representation matters. Let's, let's just be clear. Um, there, are, there are many, um, many times that uh, African Americans in leadership are not seen, are not viewed. As an example, when I came into this seat, uh, Dr. Thompson, before I came into the seat, Dr. Thompson was one of, I believe, eight African American vice presidents of instruction, not students, not uh, student services, but of instruction out of the 116 campuses. That that's not a large number. Now, there's probably about 20-ish, 20 uh, uh, 2022 African American presidents. I'm not sure how many of them are African American men, uh, but I would say this that. I'm inspired when I see st when students when students say to me that they're happy that I'm here. And I'll give you a case in point. I was actually going to use this in my conclusion, but I'm going to give the case in point because you brought it up. Did uh, did Ian just walk in? There was a, a young man that uh, that works with um, with Coach and Coach Keenan, and I saw him in the lobby this morning, and he was looking for campus safety. I walked him to campus safety, we're having side conversations. He then walks back with me, and we're just talking. I'm saying, hey, well, what's your, um, uh, what's your uh, degree in? What are, you, what are your plans? And I'm by my office, I walk in the office, and, I, and I'm still talking to him, and I realize he's gone silent, because I hear his feet, and then he stops. And I, and I said, well, what, what, what's going on? He said, well, can I ask you a question? Sure. What do you do here? Because <laughs> he was shocked that the black man in the suit was walking into the side door into an office, and then when I said the Vice President of Instructional Services, the, the, the academic services, the basic point that he said was, I am happy that I met you today. I see that, I'm in, that I can do this, not only to finish at Chabot, but to also be able to get my degree when I leave here. That was this morning. So when we talk about it, am I the right black man? I don't know about that, Art, but I know I'm the right leader for this particular job. I know that I'm, I'm the right leader that just happens to be African American. I think that when we talk about leading and we talk about students have to be first. Equity has to be right there. We have to be able to care about each and every one of the students that are here. When we talk about if I'm the right black man, here's the other piece, that, that when we're talking about a campus culture, I think it's very important to, uh, to recognize that culture is something that we have to touch every day. And what do I mean by that? How about if we started a campaign? How about if we started a high campaign? Not the one you're thinking about. What about the high campaign? <laughs> if we walked around campus and said hello, what if we all said we are going to say hello to every single person that we walk by here on campus, whether they're a student, whether they're faculty, whether they're classified professionals? We don't do that. That's culture. That's culture. Culture leads to morale. And so I think that's something as simple as walking around and saying hello to people, saying it with a smile, and maybe even saying, how are you today, and actually meaning it, that builds a culture. 
that builds. So as a leader, that's something that I would promote. That's something that I think it's important. That's something that I think that we have to be able to do small steps to be able to create the culture, the work environment, and the academic setting for, uh, for students to take this to the next level for their, the teaching and learning of all the students in our community. Good morning, Dr. Cooks. Bobby Nakamoto, Dean of Social Sciences. Good morning. Have, good morning. I have an introspective question for you. Uh, in what ways have you, or could you perpetuate systems of oppression in your administrative leadership practice? And how have you, or what are you actively doing to stop this from happening? Can you say the second half yeah. again? Yeah, sure. Or actually, if you repeat the whole thing, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right, so in what ways have you, or could you perpetuate systems of oppression in your administrative leadership practice? And how have you, or what are you actively doing to stop this from happening? Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say, first of all, I think what's important is to, we have to look at the systems, right? We have to, there, there are contracts, there are policies, there are procedures, there are some things that, uh, that we have to follow. So there, so on one hand, there's identifying what are those barriers, what are the problems, what are those issues that are causing oppression, that are causing barriers for students to be successful. Um, and I would even add classified professionals and also faculty, right? right? What are the barriers? So you have to identify them first. Uh, I think that there's, there's, the, there's the long view and then there's the, the shorter view. I think the longer view is that you have to be able to work together working with uh, everyone, all the constituents involved, to be able to change that said policy or set procedure um, or rule or whatever that might be. I think, so I think that's the, kind of the long piece. I think the, the short piece becomes you, you find creative ways to uh, accomplish the goal that keeps students first and that um, allows you to be equitable to whoever you're working with. Um, I think when we, when we talk about barriers and we talk about enrollment, for example, I think one of the things that we can do is, for example, um, uh, Scholarship Sunday. Scholarship Sunday, right? What's preventing us from going into churches that are in the local community on Sunday and start registering people? Maybe they give you an opportunity to speak to the church, but then you can go in whatever the, the hall or, you know, whenever they're getting the snacks and the, and the stale cookies and the punch, right? Then, then, right, when they come out, and you're there. That's an opportunity. It may only be five. It may only be 10. But I believe that if we do that on a regular basis, that's how we're going to be able to, to deal with some of these barriers, right? Some of the barriers, uh, Bobby, I would say are just, are simply, some are in their minds. Some, are, some people didn't have a great experience in school. Some people, school wasn't great for them. So they're not even interested in having a conversation about school, let alone coming onto that campus. So I think that we have to go to them. And Scholarship Sunday would be one way, uh, that an opportunity that as president, I would wanna explore, are there opportunities to be able to do that? I think we also can go to the, to the Boys and Girls Club. I think we can go to, this, to Scouts. I think we can go uh, to the tutoring program at Bret Hart for uh, Bret Hart Middle School with uh, the NAACP. I think we can go to barber shops. I think we can go to hair salons. I think that that's the way that we're going to be able to kind of dig ourselves out of this enrollment piece, as well as making sure that students know that this is the place they want to be, this is the place they should want to be, and we are going to be here to be able to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Cooks. Good morning. My name is Tracy Coleman. I'm the Dean of Applied Technology and Business. So my question is really around accountability. As a leader, accountability is extremely important. And as a leader on this campus, I push accountability in my division and it starts with me. So as the leader of the campus, as the president, what would be your process to ensure accountability is adhered to on this campus to your point about increasing morale and the culture on the campus? I believe it starts with accountability. So how would you exemplify that and then hold people accountable? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I think we have to, everyone has to be clear on what, uh, what standard people are being held accountable to. Um, again, I said there's, there are policies, uh, there are handbooks, 
there are contracts, right? So I think first of all is making sure that everyone is hearing the same thing at the same time so that the expectation and the standard is clear, right? I think the standard has to be clear. Sometimes what ends up happening is that there's a lot of assumptions that people know what the expectation is and what the standard is. Uh, I think secondly, uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, yes, you do need time for things to marinate. I think you do need time for people to come, come on board. But I also think that if there are, if there are situations where, um, get kind of to Art's question a little bit with, with Tracy's, that if there are um, situations where, some, where there's, there's, there's a feeling of racism or sexism or classism, um, or, or an opportunity or a situation where people think that um, some, something's not fair, right, and hold, that someone was able to kind of slide. I think that those, those situations, you have to hit head on. You have to talk about in, kind of in that moment. You have to be able to say, this is, this is the standard. This is the expectation. We did not meet that standard and that expectation. We need you to meet that standard and that expectation. Please, moving forward, and hopefully... It doesn't happen a second time, but if it does, then you have to take other measures um, moving forward. But I do think that, um, I think that sometimes people think that the rules don't apply to them. <laughs> that is just something that's, that may be in a, in a handbook or in a, in a policy and procedure. And I just think that, again, that if we have open lines of communication and if there's trust, then I, I start with the belief that everyone has good intentions. Right, so I'm not. I'm going to start with that. Whatever that um, that mistake was, or that, or what happened, uh, that where it seems as though you're not accountable, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt on the on the first place, right? Because I'm going to hope that there's trust and open lines of communication, and if that continues, then again, then you have to have to move forward. I, I want to say one other piece about this part is that. What I've, something else I learned to, to earlier question, something else I've learned in this leadership position is that um, things are going to happen. There's a lot of moving parts in what we do here at Chabot. A lot of moving parts between students, between faculty, classified professionals. Things are moving a mile a minute. Sometimes there's this thing, where math, uh, I think that was, uh, right, there, there's the, the standard deviation or the, or the margin of error, right, the margin of error. There's, there are going to be things that fall through the cracks. There's going to be things that um, that are mistakes. And, and my leadership style is, is more so about um, let's talk about it, let's identify it, but ultimately let's talk about how we're going to move it forward. I'm, I'm not a big proponent of um, really uh, um, um, critiquing someone in a particular way because I know that ev I trust that everyone's working hard. Everyone's trying to do the best they can for the students. Everyone's trying to juggle the same things that some of our students are going through some of our classified professionals and, and faculty are going through in terms of challenges, right? So my point is, is that as the president of Chabot College, I think that it's important to recognize when mistakes happen, absolutely. Are they going to happen? Yes. But I'm definitely most interested in how do we fix it and how do we get it to the point that it doesn't necessarily happen in that particular way again. Good morning, Dr. Cooks. Neva Bandelow, director of the California Early Childhood Mentor Program, housed here at Chabot. Uh, my question today is for you in thinking about the programs we have here at Chabot, the Early Childhood Lab School, the Early Childhood Faculty Preparing Students for their Certificates and AA degrees, and you know, our mentor program supporting students as they reach their practicum and beyond. What will you do in a time when there is a mass exodus of early childhood workforce? How will you strengthen our collaboration efforts in order to increase enrollment for early childhood and ready the workforce for early childhood um, you know, support educators in such a critical time? Absolutely. Thank you, Neva. Uh, First of all, as a former teacher, <laughs> I, I believe that uh, the PK-12 education system is vital, right? I believe that when we're talking about preschool, uh, TK, when we're talking about kindergarten, I'll say up to maybe first or second, right, that um, those folks are, are, are definitely doing 
um, a lot of great work. I think that when we talk about um, uh, a pipeline, an education pipeline, when I first came uh, to Chabot, uh, we started a organization called uh, Chabot Association for Teacher Education. Uh, and the idea was that it was going to kind of partner with early childhood uh, to be able to ultimately find young people that were interested in going into uh, either childcare or ECD or even elementary and secondary. And um, the pandemic happened, so there was a little interruption and uh, we're trying to get that moving forward now. And the interesting thing is that now there's funding for that. There's statewide funding for that. So as president, I would absolutely wanna get together a group of, of constituents that are going to um, identify what our needs are here with early childhood in terms of our programs. Uh, we also have the great lab school as well. How do we continue to, to build both of those pretty much simultaneously? And then how do we uh, create a pipeline for students from particular, uh, maybe even from particular schools? Uh, there's a conversation to be had around academies. Um, some of you may be familiar with that with, in secondary schools, but there may be an opportunity to work with one of the high schools to create an early childhood academy or an education uh, academy that will then feed in to Chabot that they will then um, help prepare them for the workforce. Thank you. I recognize that we have more questions than we have time that this will be our last question from the audience before we transition to closing remarks by Dr. Cooks. Good afternoon, Dr. Cooks. Good Elsa afternoon. Sines, Counselor Coordinator for CalWorks and Fresh Success. Chabot College has been a designated Hispanic serving institution for over um, a decade. Over 44% of our students self-identify as Latino, Latino, Latinx. As president, how would you ensure that the campus institutionalizes best practice of truly being a thriving Hispanic serving institution? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we're approximately 40, 41% uh, Latinx, if I'm not mistaken, and so um, that's close to to over half, to about half. And so I think that one, uh, the work that we do for the college, um, we're doing for everyone, and the Latinx students are the, definitely going to be able to benefit from that. I think that when we talk about um, El Centro, we talk about uh, the different learning communities that are supporting um, our Latinx students. I think as president, I would want to continue. To, uh, to provide resources for them, to uh, be able to meet with the leadership and have conversations about what do we need to do next to take this to the next level, to be able to, to continue to grow. Um, I think also too, I think what's, what's also begun to happen as well, as I noted earlier with, uh, with uh, Nisians Unite and with Movement, I think that this is a great opportunity for all of the different learning communities to grow, um, to, to develop, and I think also too, uh, what I'm seeing and what I'm excited about is that uh, there are these, these groups that are going to support, in this particular case, Latinx students, um, but I would say that this is, this is a growing matter um, across campus. And so I think when we talk about 40% Latinx, um, I'd be interested and curious about what are other things that we need to do that we're not doing to be able to uh, serve the needs of those particular students. And I, as president, I would definitely be open to that conversation moving forward. Thank you, thank you to the audience members who asked questions and apologies again for those who were not able to ask their question. Before we conclude today's forum, we invite you Dr. Cooks to provide a brief closing statement. There are five minutes allotted for this closing statement. Thank you, Dio. So I, I think what's, what's important to note is that what I hope I was able to share is that through 30 years of being in public education, uh, I, I think my resume hopefully speaks for itself in the sense that uh, I've worked at a variety of different levels, um, at a variety of different positions, um, from, from teaching, all levels, to uh, leadership, to being a researcher, being, being a, uh, a published author, um, being into theory, and be the idea of theory into practice um, as I move forward in this leadership journey. I think that some folks might say, well, you know what? He's only been a, a community college administrator for, uh, for five years. Oh, that's, that's too short. He, he, doesn't, he may not know enough. Uh, 
What I will say is this, as I stated earlier about um, my character, my competency, and my confidence, I don't think that there's anyone else that you're going to find as a candidate that's going to work harder, that's gonna work smarter, or work more tirelessly to take Chabot to the next level. There, there's an opportunity uh, always to apply for different jobs. I didn't apply anywhere else. I don't wanna just be a president. I wanna be a president of Chabot College. And so I'm hoping that I can follow in that same legacy of Reed Buffington and Robert Colson and Susan Sperling. And I would ask you all to award me the opportunity to be the 10th president of Chabot College. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Cooks, for your interest in the role of Chabot College President for spending this last hour with us. Um, I want to remind the audience that the online feedback form will be available until Sunday, May 21st at 11, uh, through 1159 p.m. You'll receive an email with that link by tomorrow morning at the latest. So again, please join me in thanking Dr. Jamal Cooks. Thank you.